Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 81 in Libraries and Response. Um, as many of you know, uh, we've been doing these since the pandemic was uh, uh, formally declared in okay. 2020. Um, so, yes, yeah, Stephen? In 2020, uh, in response to the the, the pandemic like declaration, everybody's going, well, "What is this all about? What are, what's how how lethal, how contagious is this virus?" And the entire world, everybody in the world, was immediately affected. It it literally changed civilization overnight. Nothing has ever had so much sudden impact. Not world wars; they take months and months. But this just hit everybody all at once. And we all had to uh, adjust. And so that was that was the question of the moment. And, and so we offered, you know, that question, well, okay, well, what is a library if the building is closed? And that began the whole sequence of, of uh, questions and answers and suppositions and the rest of it, as well as a series of other types of crises that rolled along that year. You may recall it was only... Uh, a month or two later, the the Floyd murder triggered a you know massive social upheaval. Uh, we've had economic crisis, we've had political crisis. I mean, January six is a significant event in the history of the U.S. Uh, and uh, and of course the the big the big one is the climate crisis. So we are going to get underway here, and and. begin with uh, today's session. So who are you going to call when disaster hits? Uh, disaster busters. You'll forgive me, Joe. I was just kind of trying to find a little levity in what is otherwise generally dire circumstances. Uh, but our our topic today is uh, getting to know ITDRC, the uh, Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. And um, I pulled up this image here just because it's so sad, and also because it's Vermont. Uh, people have speculated, well, okay, where's where's the best place to ride out, you know, climate crisis? And a lot of people thought, well, Vermont, you know, they're just kind of in that little spot. They don't have uh, the worst weather. They're not really hit by hurricanes, and, you know, it's kind of moist. They don't get fires, and so it's a good place. Well, it turns out it can flood in Vermont, and it did this very year, uh, just so to make the point that no one is exempt from these uh, these events. So uh, Joe is with us today. We'll get, get to him in a moment. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, an open consortium of, of tech innovating libraries around the world doing different interesting things with technology. Uh, our host uh, is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, based in The Hague, and uh, is also recording these sessions, which are all archived at giglibraries.net on the Libraries and Response page. You'll see a list of all of the, the well, previous 80 sessions, the recording links uh, on uh, YouTube, and a list of some... 150, 175 outstanding speakers, like we have another yet today. Joe's re, uh, joining us again. He's been on before. Uh, our sponsor, uh, happily, is IMLS. They have come in to give us a little boost in the cost of producing these things. Thank you, IMLS. So, libraries responding to, as I was mentioning, a cascade of crises that have come along. You know, there was COVID and, and Climate, of course, always, every day. Uh, AI, a new a new player in the scene. It's a, a crisis. Yes, it seems to be because we don't know what it is. Some of the some of the predictions are dire. Some are perhaps naive. Some are happy. You know, the sooner the better. A lot of people are saying, "Well, we're not among those people," but it's it's a serious issue and uh, one that's going to absorb a lot of attention it is sort of like uh, absorbing a lot of attention and especially in the library community because this is about information and uh, and what does that impact on libraries 
What will it do to library operations? What can libraries, how can libraries use this to support patrons? We've had five or so AI focused sessions uh, since, uh, since we started. The last one with David Lankus, uh, now at the University of Texas uh, Information School, talked about the opportunity that librarians have to help patrons utilize these tools to tell their stories, that communities can, that there's a tremendous amount of useful, helpful, interesting information found in communities that can be told, but it's difficult to, you know, tell a story, to write an interesting story. And it takes a number of tools to write, to create, write, and publish such stories. Well, this maybe is where AI can come into to play. We would uh, perhaps suggest a new category of AI literacy. So stay tuned for that. And of course, the new one uh, is war breaking out. Uh, it seems far away, but you know, think back. Uh, mobs storming the nation's capital is not far from it. So here we have an image. This, this is all of this kind of together uh, with the world longing for the good old days when the only concern was nuclear annihilation. Simpler, perhaps, but uh, I was there, and you know, it was it was present as a uh, as a thought. Uh, this is probably my favorite uh, illustrator. Uh, Cal guy has just amazing ability to both uh, depict concepts and be relevant. So these are, uh, this is a map of just last year. Uh, these are billion dollar disasters, which are increasing in time, but it, it just shows the various types of disasters. Um, not as much in the far West this last year, but you know, the trend is definitely in that way, uh, but it's a good depiction of the range of types of, of uh, disasters. And here's a graph we've been tracking for several years now, uh, before the last few, when it was starting to sort of dangerously move up, especially with this 2018 spike. Uh, and then now, you know, it's like ordinary. Uh, the trend is, obviously that we're in for more severe, more frequent extreme weather events. So fires and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and, I don't know, infestations. Uh, you know, this is a, this warmer climate is a happy for uh, bugs. Of course, I'm not telling the folks in the South anything new, but uh, in the Western drier parts of, of the country and in cooler areas, like where I am in the Bay Area, we, we haven't had a big bug problem, but we're seeing more of them now. So what happens when it when it goes down? You you know what do you do? Well, you call Joe. You call ITDRC. And, and I'm sorry if this sounds like a boost. Uh, that's actually what it is because ITDRC is a phenomenal uh, organization that Joe is going to tell us about. He's going to give us the background on it and uh, and how it all works and some stories that, uh, that they've had just this year. They, you know, they're all over the place. And uh, Joe has been helpful to us uh, on the technology front. He's really knowledgeable uh, about communications technology, which is kind of the, the bread and butter of ITDRC and their recovery. Uh, and we've done a number of projects and he's been involved and helped us a lot. And so we couldn't be happier to be friends of ITDRC and to, uh, give Joe uh, a chance to share this information. And that information, and I guess the point of this today is of course we're recording this and it will be archived. And so it will, it will be a, a resource that people can refer to later if they're not here today. We generally have as many more people view these sessions afterwards that, that attend in, in the first place. So it becomes an archive and a resource ongoing. Uh, so everyone should know about ITDRC. We have a, a typically we have a significant participation from the, the state library agencies, which is makes us extremely happy. Uh, we've also getting support from some agencies, but they also have the opportunity to communicate policy and resources and offer general support, a, a place that many libraries turn for information. And so having, having the state agencies be aware of ITDRC 
and and be able to suggest that in places where people are in some kind of distress could be a, a tremendously valuable uh, piece of knowledge, a small bit of knowledge, but very large value of knowledge. It's interesting, I'll, I'll finish with this. It's interesting to note uh, the, the investment curve, I uh, would call it on uh, disaster response or preparation. So in the beginning, you know, Yes, we need to, but today I've <laughs> my boss is on me. I've got to I've got to deal with this this urgent matter. We'll get to it, but just not today. So that's the standard sort of rationale for doing it tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Uh, and then it happens. You know, it, it just happens everywhere. It will happen everywhere. And then that's it. You know, price is no object. I need help now, and so. Then it's a mad scramble to deal with, you know, whatever the, the, the nature of the disaster is. They invariably involve wide scale outages of electricity and communications. Uh, and then after it's over, then there's the kind of the, the, the slope trails off, depending on how much people learned. OK, we know it's going to it can happen because it just did. So we're going to be ready next time. Or it was just a freak occurrence and we'll be back to normal. So it'll either trail off slowly or, or just drop off completely. And that's just the way, you know, we're built apparently. Uh, so at least knowing what to do when it actually hits is super valuable. And that's what we're here about today. Um, ITDRC is just going to give a quick overview from uh, what we had on the uh, event page. Uh, it's all volunteer. These are all uh, technical professionals that uh, that are either independent or they're employees of large companies who have given them permission to take time off to respond to these circumstances. I said this this number has doubled in I think just the last few years, and uh, uh, so being able to respond in 24 hours anywhere in the country including Puerto Rico and, and uh, Haiti is really impressive because you got to move gear and people suddenly. Um, they, they have now staged resources in all 10 uh, FEMA regions and have close relations with FEMA and, and responding to FEMA and working with FEMA is one of the main tasks that people have in, uh, in these disaster scenarios. Uh, thousands of communities, uh, a year or two ago, thousands. It's just amazing. And that uh, uh, that many responses and that many open sites, it's really grown, Joe. I'm just so amazed and impressed. So with that, I will turn it over to Joe Hillis, the operations director for, for uh, ITDRC and our special guest today. And welcome, Joe. Thank you, Don. I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And I, when I was getting ready for this, I uh, let's see if I hopefully you got the right slide here. Um, there we go. Um, as I was preparing for this, I remember you being down here in, in the DFW area when we received one of our, our new assets. And uh, I was trying to put a year on that. And I don't remember what it was, 15 or 16 or somewhere in there. But uh, obviously, you've been a friend of the organization for a while. I appreciate what you're doing and appreciate the opportunity to connect with your um with, with your followers um so it, hopefully you're seeing this slide here what is itdrc um you know as don mentioned i mean we're a, a nationwide um nonprofit. um our, our mission really is to help communities you know with quick recovery uh after a disaster at least get the recovery process started um, we do a, a fair amount of preparation work, um, whether it's through exercises, whether it's through guidance or, or whatnot, um, just to make sure that communities can become more resilient. And, um, you know, certainly with the number of the, with the types of events that are happening now, um, with the frequency, with the, um, just a large impact of these events, um, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to compare it to, what our early days were like, the Hurricane Sandys of 2012, and 
you know, some of the other events, but now you get to the events now. And, and, and back then we maybe opened a handful of sites that we were helping um, in, in communities and, and whether they were in libraries or churches or schools or whatever that was. Um, and then you fast forward to now and, and think of some of the hurricanes that we've done over, certainly over the last few years, you know, we're open, opening, you know, a hundred plus sites, 150 plus sites um, after that. Now, part of that's because you know, we now have more capacity. Um, we're better, better known, you know, throughout, um, throughout the country. And so, you know, I, as much as I would like to trend that, I, I definitely want to make sure that, you know, I'm, we're considering all factors on that. But the long and the short, I mean, we're, we're based in North Texas. Um, we're vendor neutral. So we love all of our, uh, you know, all of our partners in the tech sector. Um, we do uh, work with a number of them, the most recognizable names in technology uh, who support our mission and whether it's through people or products or, or dollars or, or, you know, whatever that is. Uh, sometimes just storytelling. Storytelling is, I listen to our business development um, leader and and when he's talking to these new uh, companies that want to come on and, and that's an option. It's like, just, you know, write a story about us um, and, and share us with your networks. Um, and, and that's, that's super helpful what we do. Um, we keep one leg in the emergency management space. So we're always working with um, you know, certainly FEMA, um, a lot of the state emergency managements, and in a lot of cases, local emergency management. So at the county level, in some cases, the city level, uh, organizations like 211, for example, the, the information and referral um, sources, you know, we, we try to keep uh, them aware of, you know, when we're somewhere active, what resources we have available, things like that. So it is kind of a, a, an all front um to try to make sure that we're reaching the people and that our resources are available you know, where they need to be. Um, so this is actually a few month old map. Uh, I don't know exactly when I pulled this map, but um, you know, these green dots are actually open sites. Uh, at any given time, we have you know, 14, 1500 open sites that we're tending to. Many of these you know, were established back during COVID. Um, and had I have had a little bit more forethought on this, I would have probably loaded up some more slides about our COVID response. But to Don's point, you know, you were forced to close your doors back then, and there was nothing wrong with your uh, with your internet connection. I mean, it was a federally declared disaster, so it certainly checked the box for us. Um, and so we were fortunate uh, back then to get a large grant um, from Facebook and, and actually from some other uh, organizations who provide us with equipment and, and dollars and things like that to make sure that we could extend those internet connections outside of the four walls. So it, it was many, many, many libraries, many schools, coffee shops. I mean, I, I can't begin to tell you the diversity of places that offered up their internet connection to be that so we could give them a free access point they could put it on the outside of their building would serve their parking lot or the, the green spaces around it where people could come uh and and still still stay connected certainly you know for distance learning for telehealth and all those things so uh anyway this is the red side the red dots are, are places we've been closed and um so you can see you know we've opened thousands of sites you know throughout our 15 years um, something important to note for those that have never experienced a disaster, um, basically every dollar that you spend in a federally declared disaster really becomes reimbursable. Um, or, and I'm saying that in some cases, it's 90% of that the dollars become reimbursable. And certainly in COVID, it was 100% reimbursable. So every dollar that your city or your county spent um, or your state spent responding to COVID was reimbursed by the federal government. Um, outside of those disasters, the typical flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes, and things like that, um, there's a cost component to your county. And if your county is actually declared as a federal disaster or, or eligible for federal disaster assistance, um, typically you're on the hook for 25, 10 or 25% of that bill. So one of the benefits of what we do and, and is that the fair market value of the services we bring to your community. And that includes volunteer labor, that includes the equipment we said, the services, those count towards your match. So just as an example, back during the Joplin tornadoes back in 2011, 
um, they had about a hundred thousand volunteers that came, um, of course, truckloads of, you know, with pallets of water and cases of diapers and things like that. Um, and they were, they tracked that. And that's, that's the caveat. You have to track that. You have to be able to prove that. Uh, but nevertheless, those represent real dollars to your agencies or to your, your communities in that you don't have to write a check for that 10% for that. So keep that in mind. It's very important. Um, I've personally seen, uh, we were in Arkansas for a tornado at some point, and they had been hit three years and three days prior to this next tornado. And a brand new junior high school, two-story, beautiful campus um, that was being built had been destroyed. They were to the point where they were laying grass um, at that school. It was going to be reopened for that year. Um, and that that entire school under construction was destroyed. Point being is, is the three counties that were declared were all bankrupt because they had settled. They had to pay that 10% out of pocket for to, for the disaster three years ago. So they were all bankrupt, they didn't have dollars for that. So it was very important for them to track the value of all these services that come in, all these organizations. And that can be the Red Crosses and the Team Rubicons and you know the ITDRCs and the All Hands and Hearts and all, all the organizations that come in to help. Um, you know, they, they will help you with that match on that. Um, so our service priorities, life safety is always the top of mind. They get the first cut at our resources. Um, and then mass care, so feeding and sheltering, uh, making sure that people have a place to stay. And, um, you know, so uh, that's the internet connections that we put into these shelters. That's the, the, the dish TV or the, you know, um, the uh, program, the computer banks where people can come and sit down, their computer cafes uh, where people can come down, sit down and get online. Our third priority is community recovery, and, and there's a lot of things that kick off when you have a disaster and certainly around volunteer and donations management. I mean, what do you do with that second disaster where you just have truckloads and truckloads and truckloads coming in of, you know, bags full of, you know, shoes and clothes and things like that. That has to be sorted. That has to be, you know, in, in a lot of cases, it's actually, you know, dumped. Uh, but nevertheless, that's something that your community is going to have to deal with. Uh, and then finally, long-term recovery, and this is the multi-year thing, um, and this could be, you know, a decade or longer um, to recover, you know, after a catastrophic event. So uh, our, the, it is still a priority, it's still on our radar, um, but, you know, it's certainly in the early days of a disaster, these are our focus, and then, of course, we'll support these communities for, you know, for the duration. So just high level of the organization, as Don mentioned, you know, a little over 4,000 uh, technical volunteers uh, globally. I mean, we have about 100 and close to 150 international volunteers, and, and we've been doing a little bit more international work each year. We pretty much find ourselves responding to a disaster outside of the U.S. Um, again, it's uh, more than anything, it's just because these disasters are becoming more frequent, there's less resources out there available. And so, you know, we're getting more requests for help internationally. We do have a critical information systems team. Uh, and, and those are the folks that have a, uh, a kind of a government background check, um, which is done on them. So it's, they have to be FBI InfraGuard members. So that gets them a public trust background check. And then sometimes we're working with sensitive information. Uh, and so we want to make sure that, you know, whomever we're assisting, that they have some sort of, um, uh, that they're comfortable, that the people who are working on their systems or have exposure to that data uh, are trustworthy. Um, so as well, we have an emergency communication support team. And if you think about all the radios and, and telephones and, and things that are needed um, to respond to a disaster, uh, we have folks that are credentialed to be able to help support those. Um, you think about these events, they become multi-day events or multi-week of multi-month events on, on larger disasters. And your teams are typically don't have enough people to do, you know, keep up with the day-to-day -day load. So they're certainly going to be um, supplementing with people from other agencies, other organizations to come in and help. And so, um, you know, these again are, are credentialed people. They may work for another city, another county, another state organization. And so they're able to come in. Uh, and help supplement your teams for you know a couple of weeks or so. Um, another thing was mentioned earlier, we do have uh, equipment um, in all 10 FEMA regions, and, and that includes caches in Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Um, we have a little over 18,000 serialized assets in our system. 
So they're distributed, you know, fairly equally. And we have our main warehouse, the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, and then our tech task force program. And that is, you know, uh, a lot of the larger technology companies um, we're able to get people from those teams. We're able to get resources from them. We're certainly able to get subject matter expertise. So if you have a particular issue um, that, you know, is unique to your agency, uh, this is something we can likely, you know, tap our tech task force folks to come in and help with. Um, on the survivor side, we don't do a ton that's public facing, if you will. We're typically supporting the organizations um, who are providing that re that that um, assistance. But um, certainly in shelters and, and um, community gathering places, we do provide Wi-Fi. Um, that is, uh, you know, communications and, and, you know, our tagline here is calm is aid. So communications is a form of aid. But, you know, besides power, um, you know, the next most important thing uh, is having connectivity. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of benefit to that. If you think about the, uh, you know, from a survivor's uh, standpoint, you know, if they've experienced a catastrophic event, they want to talk to somebody, right? Typically want to call their family um, and let them know we're okay, we're staying in the shelter. But conversely, you also have the family who is like, oh my God, I heard this event happened. I wonder if my loved one is okay. So they're also looking, you know, that. So, you know, by providing this connectivity, it's, it's able to kind of uh, chill things down, you know, take down the temperature of, you know, of the worry. Um, we can't eliminate it, but just hearing the loved one's voice on the other end um, is typically enough to, you know, calm things down. So cell phone charging stations, certainly important when people flee and, and whether they've lost their chargers, left their chargers, uh, or maybe not, you know, don't even have a device, whatever that is. But we provide those types of things in shelters, um, you know, directly for survivors. Again, I mentioned nonprofit support. So, you know, certainly all the social service agencies, you know, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, uh, the Team Rubicons of the world, um, we support them. And uh, in, in that respect, it allows them to focus their dollars and, you know, their people on, you know, the mission and it's taking care of the people. So we help them with back end support. We'll provide, you know, uh, all the resources for these community recovery centers, the multi-agency resource centers, they call them a MARC. Uh, they don't in California, they call them something different in California and the, and the name escapes me right now. Uh, but distribution points and things like that, that's where um, you know, we'll provide the connectivity and the resources for that. Um, we do a lot to support our government partners and usually it's with temporary infrastructure uh, or tech support. Um, you know, I, when we got into this and I retired from um, the fire service and, and so consequently municipal government. And, and my assumptions were that every community had a tech team or an IT group or a, at least a director. Um, and, and so what we've learned over the years is, you know, going to the Pilgrim, Nebraska's population 378, you know, they have one paid employee or one and a half paid employees. And so, um, you know, we've certainly been to a lot of areas around the country and whether it's, you know, the foothills of Kentucky where, you know, Geek Squad is their tech team. Um, so we've realized that there are a lot of gaps that we're able to fill for them, but, uh, connectivity, um, you know, for different types of things and, and certainly resources, nobody has, you know, and not, I say nobody has, but very few organizations have 50, a hundred, 200 computers laying around that they could get on a day's notice. Um, it's certainly not something you can run to the best buy and source and, um, you know, trying to place an order with Dell or something like that, but, you know, these are, only needed for a short period of time. And sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a, you know, a month, uh, but, you know, we're much of a landing library as well. Uh, emergency services support, and that's certainly for, you know, fires and, and floods and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, connectivity is probably our number one requested thing. Uh, and that's along with temporary, you know, network infrastructure, uh, call centers, communications, um, anything to do with, you know, communications, whether it's radio, whether it's microwave, uh, Wi-Fi, internet connectivity, whatever it is, those are all things that we do. Um, but we also help with damage assessment and whether that's, you know, driving a street view like the Google Street View uh, to help with damage assessment or, or, you know, putting a drone up and mapping an area. Um, you know, those are things that we're able to help with. It's There's a lot of other organizations out there doing that and a lot of cities and counties have those resources in-house. We're kind of this, what we consider a gateway of last resort. So if you if you don't have that capability, you know, reach out to us and we'll, we'll be able to help with that in some way. 
Uh, certainly community recovery support and, um, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, call center, if you want to set up a call center, if people can call and find out where to get resources, where to go, uh, we'll provide that infrastructure for that. In some cases, we may provide the people for that. Um, there are certainly some you know, catastrophic events that have happened where they, you know, had surges of thousands of phone calls of, you know, people inquiring. Um, and so we're able to provide those, you know, call centers on short, short notice. Um, connectivity for point of sale. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you, it, you know, certainly when there's a, a tornado or a flood or something where there's no power, no communications, um, you have things like gas stations that have plenty of fuel in the, in the tanks, but they don't have a way to accept credit cards, for example. So, um, you know, we'll give them a temporary means to be able to do that. And so the only box that we have to check, we have only got one, one requirement here and, and anything we do must benefit the whole community. So as long as it benefits the whole community, you know, they can have anything we have and, and you know, at, at no cost at all. Um, but we also provide technical recovery support. And I mentioned schools and libraries. And, um, you know, one of the things, for example, we had Hurricane Laura a couple of years ago in, in Calcasieu Parish, Louisiana, and they had 70 schools, uh, but only five people on their tech team. Uh, and so we were able to come in and, and supplement their team, go assess all the schools for the damage. Um, you know, when they found a camera offline or a Wi-Fi access point that was missing, or in some cases, I mean, they had, you know, roofs blown off the buildings. Uh, and so we would go in and, and, you know, recover equipment for them. So these are, you know, we're a force multiplier, um, you know, for events like that. Um, and so, you know, certainly we'll help the small business community get back online. It's very important to restart the commerce inside of your community as fast as you can. Um, and, and that will kind of minimize the, you know, just a, the financial impact to your community. But with this longer term, we do, you know, Wi-Fi for temporary housing sites. And, you know, certainly the, the wildfires of California are really good examples. We're currently doing this in Florida for, you know, after the hurricane, this year's hurricane, where, you know, FEMA or the county, the state, they may bring in anywhere from, you know, four to 400 trailers and put them all in kind of a temporary trailer park, if you will. Um, and so we'll provide a, um, just a Wi-Fi hotspot uh, where the kids can come do their homework or, you know, people that don't necessarily have the means to afford that connection, um, where at least they, you know, they have this, you know, the ability to get online. Again, no cost. These are things we leave there in some cases for two years. I think one we did after the campfire was two and a half years. So uh, again, all at no cost to the community. Um, and so one of the things we um, we don't talk about too much publicly, and that's cyber incident support. And um, you know, we realize that all disasters are not necessarily smoking holes in the ground. Uh, and so the uh, you know once a, an entity an organization or you know has been impacted by this i mean typically because cities and counties are unique in that they have multiple sites they have multiple departments divisions things like that but what's common to many of them is they have a network that you know connects them all together and having a ransomware you know running loose on on your network is is really um, unfortunately, they may have unfettered access to every end of, of, of your network. So where ITDRC, you know, will come in, we won't run the event for you. And that's because we're a volunteer driven organization. Most of our folks have, you know, a, a week to two weeks max, uh, you know, time off that they can come and help. And so it's not, we don't really have that continuity to be able to run a, an event for six months or, you know, a year in some cases uh, to get them back whole. But we can provide them with smart hands and, you know, we'll, we'll certainly stand up a, a second network, one that's not infected, and that way they can kind of, um, at least uh, we kind of consider it a command and control network, so they're able to communicate, um, request assistance outside, but it leaves their uh, original network intact, and that way they can do the forensics on that, they can, you know, do whatever they have to do to recover that. Um, and so, you know, we'll provide hands again to do that or equipment. So I... Uh, Don encouraged me to invite somebody, um, you know, that, that we've helped in the past. And, and uh, Philip Dixon uh, from Curry County, Oregon, was kind enough to jump on with just minutes notice this morning. Um, we, um, we were called to assist them. They were hit by uh, ransomware earlier this summer. And um, so Phil was our primary contact there. And he, he was the one that pretty much led the, uh, 
uh, the recovery operations there. And so, Phil, I didn't know if you have a minute, if you'd be happy, willing to share a little bit about your story and perhaps maybe how we work together to to uh, clean things up. Uh, sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Joe, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I'd like to just start off by saying, uh, b before the event that Curry County experienced with a ransomware attack, I had not heard of ITDRC, and uh, it was a new organization for me. And I was having a conversation with a lieutenant in the sheriff's office because uh, it was worst case scenario here. We lost every server. We lost every workstation. Uh, the county uh, lost its backups. Uh, every bit of information going back to the 1800s was uh, wiped out. Uh, it was uh, it, it, as bad as it can it, as bad as it can be. Uh, lots of network gear was destroyed. We lost lots of physical servers. It was a complete rebuild. So uh, I was chatting initially, uh, you know, first day, maybe 24 hours into the event, and the Lieutenant Aranda uh, mentioned that she had reached out to ITDRC, your team there, Joe. And uh, there were some resources available with computers and network gear and to kind of stand up a temporary network. And I was skeptical, to be honest, because living in Curry County and Gold Beach, we're on the very edge of the Pacific Ocean here. And normally things, when you say you want 24-hour delivery, you're expecting 72. And that's on the outside because it's just uh, difficult to get here. We're six hours away from any major airport, so you really have to want to get to Gold Beach. So she mentioned that this gear was going to show up, some Surface uh, laptops and some uh, Starlink equipment and to kind of get the sheriff's office at least ability to communicate to their officers and deputies in the field. And I, to be honest, I was skeptical. And then the very next day I came in and I saw these black totes sitting there and computers laying out. And where'd this come from? And uh, I was you had my attention then, Joe. So um, uh, shortly after that, we had a ITDRC volunteer that showed up from Bend, Oregon. It's about six hours away from Gold Beach. Uh, very impressive individual. I was uh, I was uh, taken back by the level of networking and IT knowledge that he did possess. At the time, I was not a staff member of the county. I worked for the power company. The power company uh, sent me down to help get the county back online. And I've been here since... Um, uh, pretty much 2 a.m. the night the event kicked off and was here every day since then. And as the event continued to develop and we began to realize just how significant and serious it was and uh, the impact it was having to the citizens of Curry County, we had additional ITDRC team members start to come in. And everyone that I met, Joe, was fantastic. And I still try to stay in contact with all of them today. Uh, the knowledge level that these people possessed was far beyond anything that we could get uh, locally with even going over to as far away as Eugene or maybe even Portland when it comes to the level of experience these folks had and and just the, uh, the ability to troubleshoot uh, very difficult problems in a stressful environment without much support. They were all awesome. And we proceeded to continue to have ITDRC team member support here probably for the next six to eight weeks. I don't know the exact date, but Joe would. And every individual who rolled in and out of Curry County, it was always very sad to see them go. I miss them immensely. Uh, the, the way that they helped the county get back onto its feet in less than, I think it was 35 days from the time that we actually made the decision to uh, move away from insurance claims and working with the partners that are there when a, when a cyber event first hits off. It's a it's pandemonium. But once we had a good, clear plan or the county leaders had a good, clear plan and ITC or ITDRC was fully engaged, then we went through the system of rebuilding everything. And without uh, uh, Joe, your, your, your team's ITDRC support, uh, we would still be uh, without communications today. Uh, I was asked initially what my estimate was for restoring services. And uh, based on what we had when it came to manpower at the time, I gave them a figure of eight months. And of course, that was a shock and awe kind of moment. And then immediately, I think a few more calls went out to Joe's organization. Some other very stellar individuals showed up. Uh, it helped us to identify all the problems. And basically, it was a 360. Everywhere you looked, there was a fire burning and uh, Joe's team helped us put those fires out. They helped us uh, get a temporary network stood up. They provided equipment for Curry County. They helped us start to slowly provide services to our citizens. Our primary focus at the at initially was, of course, public safety. Our 911 dispatch center was down. 
There was no comms except radio traffic between dispatch and um, and deputies in the field. Uh, we were not able to look up any previous uh, information regarding a, a, a troubled suspect or an individual's house that could have had uh, some violent individuals there. So it left our deputies in on the road very exposed. And uh, it was Joe's team, ITDRC, who showed up. And within the course of just a, a few short days, we had a, a network set up. <clears throat> we were able to tap into a neighbor's uh, sieges system, which allowed us to run CAD for the sheriff's service. And we were able to start providing assistance and services back to deputies in the field. We had other ITDRC team members kind of turned over to different departments. Of course, uh, the county, as Joe mentioned, has many different agencies that uh, operate under the umbrella. From the district attorney, uh, road department, of course, the sheriff's office, the commissioners, taxation, clerk's office, just to mention a few veterans, it goes on and on, health and human services. And every one of those organizations was without communications and really without computers, not really in a position to be able to service the public. And within a very short amount of time, uh, with Joe's ITDRC support and team members, we were able to open up a limited services for pretty much all those departments. And then we had continual uh, uh, influx of new volunteers from ITDRC that continued to show up and help us resolve some pretty major lifting. Uh, some things, uh, the, the for instance, a firewall was to, was damaged during the event. And if you've ever had a chance to train out a, change out a firewall, it's a very planned process. It's not something that you rush. Well, we were given about 24 hours to throw one up. And of course, you can imagine the problems that came along with that, with network connectivity. And everybody was still very concerned. Was uh, the, the ransomware software still in the environment? Uh, what, how do you handle bringing a system back online if it, it might just become reinfected? So uh, very soon after those conversations were taking place, a decision was made to pretty much wipe everything and start from scratch. And that's exactly what we did. We tried to get copies of all the data, even though most of it was infected. We have a few files that was not in, in, impacted by the ransomware, but I'd say 95 plus percent of it was. It means that uh, every password, every network schematic, every diagram, everything that any department may have had that they need the ability to work with the vendors to provide services to the citizens, it was gone. So it was a, a deer in the headlight moment, literally. Uh, everybody kind of just looking, what do we do next? And it is a disaster. And it, it's just like, I guess, if a tornado were to hit your house, you, you, you turn around and you look, your neighbor's homes are destroyed. The street is destroyed. Your, your, your community is, very, is suffering. Uh, how do you get those services? And it was uh, Joe and ITDRC that, that showed up and, and really helped bring some uh, vision to the situation. They helped uh, with a lot of experience that they brought from previous disasters. Uh, I, I became um, uh, very enamored with ITDRC from that comes to when their volunteer would show up and work with the department. There was an immediate trust factor there. It wasn't like this was the person's first rodeo. They showed up and, and every department uh, staff member, department director immediately had full faith in the ITDRC team. Uh, within a very short time, communications were somewhat restored, and then ITDRC remained on site for us to build up and stand up our domain controllers again, get our fire server back online, helped us get a backup procedure rolling again. It was fantastic, Joe, and I can't thank you enough and, and thank the folks from ITDRC for you know, giving up their vacation time, uh, leaving the, the, the comfort of their home and families to come uh, to the other side of America and uh, help us get back online. And it, 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 I still get choked up thinking about it. it. It meant a lot. So thank you. And ITDRC, it's by far my, my favorite organization when it comes now for disaster recovery. Amazing, Philip. Uh, what, what a story. I think this, these, these kinds of stories are generally opaque to the, to the public. Uh, you know, it's just kind of all in the background, the stuff. You no, know, seems hazardous, but that's just kind of the reports. But nobody really understands the uh, the the mechanics of it, and and the fact that that bad actors are out there taking advantage of of uh, public services, and even more so. This what I'm getting is there's an added vulnerability in a in a physical disaster to being invaded like this. Is that is that correct? 
Yes, sir. Yes, Joe, yes, yes, sir. That's Phillip, right on yeah. target. Yeah, that's uh, that's terrible. Uh, there, you, uh, as you mentioned, Philip, there's so many branches to to this conversation. Uh, more than just kind of getting some power back on, which is, of course, central to to uh, uh, most everything. But you touch on kind of the, the the psychological support that you get from, you know, experienced people they are, you know, OK, calm you down a little bit. This is this is this is tough, but we'll get through it. We've done it before. You know, you'll be all right. That's that means a lot. And I don't think it's what people normally expect from from uh you know technologists anyway but 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 they get it um uh, joe i i've just got a list of questions here uh, so who who typically calls I mean, you know we've said you know you got to call them well who is that is it is it the it department of the city and the county is that typically where the call comes in or who no, in this case, and and I have to back up real fast and say and say thanks to Phil for all the kind words. I, boy, I wasn't expecting that, so thank you for that. And Phil's become a good friend, and I, I had the opportunity to swing back by uh, through his county to pick up some equipment at one point, and you know we enjoyed a great dinner together, and so certainly a a, a good friend now. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so Don, a lot of our, you know, many of our calls come through the emergency management channels. Um, so, uh, for example, here in the state of Texas, we are part of the emergency plan. Um, and so when there is an event like this, um, usually it surfaces up to the state emergency management where they're requesting resources. And that's typically when we get engaged. So uh, certainly in the case of uh, Curry County, it was the sheriff's office that made the request. Um, and that was kind of the, the introduction to the rest of the county to see how we could you know, support in other ways. But generally, the public safety or, or, you know, or the emergency management folks is where a lot of our calls come from. Yeah. Um, um, the, you make the point, Joe, about the connectivity. And it, it, it reminds me, you know, that we talk a lot about capacity and communications, you know. I want a gig, you know, if I don't have a gig, I'm a second class citizen kind of thing. But in disaster, uh, you can appreciate the difference between data and information. And you made the point exactly that the amount of data in the message, mom, we're okay, we're, we're at Phil's house, we're fine, is tiny, it's really small. But the amount of information, the value of that information is massive. That's like you say, people are freaking out because they don't know. Mm -hmm. And so having any kind of communication system that can support text level, even just text level communication is super, super valuable. So you use a variety of, <coughs> uh, of uh, communication technologies, set up wide area networks and, and local networks. Uh, can you kind of run through some of those? You, what, what do you typically use for backhaul? If somebody's, I guess if they're still connected you can tap into that if they're if it's just a general outage you have to set up a dish of some sort <laughs> can you go we through do that real quick? yeah um so a lot of our you know we use we have as many tools in a toolbox as we can and whether that's geostationary satellite whether it's you know leo satellite you know low earth orbit satellite like the starlinks and and now soon um amazon's product uh, product that's coming out um, but we use a lot of mobile broadband and, uh, we use, you know, cellular from all the carriers. Um, those are, the, those are our biggest ones. We, we're also prepared and we have, for example, we have relationships with the RENs, the research and education network. So the, through the quilt, um, we've been able to tap into their fiber networks at points, uh, to be able to get connectivity from there. We may extend it for by, by microwave. Um, so we have a number of microwave assets in, in all different bands. So from short to long range things, if we need to extend connectivity somewhere. So Don, it's typically every tool in the toolbox. I mean, and, and whether it's CBRS that we're private LTE, um, you know, we, we have a, an investment in, in that equipment now and that capability uh, as well. Well, great. And that's just more evidence of the, the flexibility, the range of capability that, that you have. The, the skills of your volunteers, I mean, we're presuming they're all technical people, but is that is that correct? I mean, you have people that can just, you know, carry crates and set up tents and what's we the range do. of, of skills? 
Yeah, I mean, so we, I mean, we're like any other organization. We've got the front of the house. We've got, you know, HR and marketing and legal and, um, you know, volunteers. Those are all volunteer positions. Um, and then, of course, then we have our technical folks. But, you know, our logistics team, uh, and, and I think I actually have a slide coming up somewhere here um, that talks about our uh, logistics team. And I'm going to, well, I, you got to go through other pictures to get there. But um, anyway, the long and the short, we do have our own internal logistics team and they do help us with everything from, you know, moving things around our warehouse to our inventory to, you know, getting the equipment in the field. And, and certainly when we're on a, a, a big event like a hurricane or a, a large wildfire, um, you know, they're helping us with our inventory. They're thinking ahead, you know, how fast is this moving? Do we need to request more resources? Um, you know, they take care of our fueling, they take care of our, you know, feeding our folks and the whole bit. So we do have, you know, lo logistics folks as well that help. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it takes, it takes a, an army to, you know, run this thing. Um, you know, fortunately we're able to do, uh, we, we've got a little history under our belt, so we're able to move pretty quickly when it comes down to, um, you know, responding to these disasters and, and, um, you know, we may be able one crew, it's like the phone company, I guess, right. One crew may be able to do, you know, X installations in a day. Um, so, you know, we don't necessarily have to put a hundred techs out into the field after a, a hurricane. Uh, but if we have the logistics folks in place, you know, to be able to support them, you know, we're able to, you know, do more with less. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, so you you mentioned your uh, you get support from a range of, of sources. Uh, one point I wanted to emphasize was the point you made about matching. This has got to be really really important to people to uh, capture that information and use it to leverage it to uh, to, uh, to match. To because match. a tiny percentage tiny. of a massive event could wipe you out. Uh, I can understand that. So that's uh, that's that's an excellent additional value supplied. But you also mentioned you you get support from a range of uh, of tech companies who supply uh, dollars and and equipment and personnel. Mm -hmm. So this was this struck me when we were visiting. Uh, you did a you did a workshop in San Francisco a few years ago, that uh, which is you know kind of we're big tech hub out here. That these companies are giving their employees permission to take time to volunteer, uh, mm -hmm. as I understood it. And the other thing that struck me was that that they they understand they have extremely valuable resources, technology, just let's just say technology, that they don't really want to uh, you know make money off of Puerto Rico in the in a in a disaster, and yet they have all this stuff that could uh, get could benefit them, and so they're turning to you, they're turning to ITDRC as a vector to move their resources to the places in need without getting in the business of, you know, of, uh, uh, of uh, providing fee services to people in disaster. I think this phenomenal business model. Is that, how recent is that? Or is that a longstanding kind of model? Well, I, I mean, I think over the years, so, you know, companies like, um, you know, Dish, for example, I think we started work with Dish in 2012. Um, Dish was always, uh, they wanted to be able to use their technology for good um, instead of just writing a check to a one organization. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to get their satellite. They wanted to get video into the shelters. I mean, they knew what they, you know, they knew what the assets they had. They wanted a way to get them out and get them integrated in there, but they didn't want it to be a part of a business model, if you will. So basically anybody who ever called DISH in a disaster and said, hey, could you donate or whatever, they would always say, hey, ITDRC takes care of, you know, our disaster response piece of that. Um, you know, we, we, AT&T is one of our big sponsors now, and, you know, they provide us with funding each year to be able to respond to a disaster um, and or to, to all disasters, I should say. And then, you know, they want to make sure that if anybody's ever worked the phone company, you know, there's nothing fast that happens with them. And so for them, uh, it was a smart investment in us. And they know we could be somewhere in 24 hours. We could be setting up, taking care of the people. Um, and so that's why they invest in us. So, you know, other companies that, you know, that Microsoft, for example, you know, Microsoft provides us with devices, you know, thousands of devices. And uh, they want to make sure that, you know, we get them into the hands of the communities that need them when they need them. They don't have the people. They, there's only a, a one or two people on their, their disaster 
the philanthropic side for disaster response. So therefore, again, they invest in us to make sure that we're able to get these resources to the people in a timely manner. So those are a few examples. One of the other ones that you mentioned, um, th there's another company it's got a fruity name which i can't mention right now but you know anytime their volunteers or employee volunteers come out they write us a check for 20 bucks an hour for every hour their volunteers do and microsoft does the same uh but point being is is you know they encourage their employees to volunteer they give them the time to do it in a lot of cases they also give us a stipend for every hour their volunteer volunteers with us if that makes sense uh, it does make sense and it's outstanding uh, behavior on the part of these uh, these companies, and it also uh, uh, illustrates their their trust in ITDRC that it's going to be uh, well spent. That it's not going to bounce back some kind of PR disaster on top of the the, right. the physical crises. Um, you you did a workshop a two day workshop in San Francisco for for technical people that I dropped in on. Uh, do you ever do these? online you ever do workshops online it gets it gets to my other question about preparations so what can you say to people that they should be thinking about in advance if they just if we would expect that sooner or later it's going to happen here but well, sooner or later it will what what would you have preferred people to have done uh, when uh, when it hits what i know you're not really in the business of preparation more in recovery but in response but what well we do and it? yeah so covid kind of forced us to move our training online so you know when the the big events that we did because we like to do an annual large training where we bring a lot of people and we try to pick a different part of the country each year to do that so during covid you know one of the ways that we adapted to that was we um we put together a hundred of our of our kits their pelican cases and so we put you know voice over ip telephones in there we put a you know a pair of microwave radios in there we put a, a firewall gateway in there put a switch we put all different things in there uh, and it was a week-long virtual training but all the students had a kit with all of the equipment in there and we put seven different types of cable in there indoor cable outdoor cable cat five cat six um and and part of that we sent no we sent fragments of it and they had to create their own cables, right? So if they couldn't make their own cables and they couldn't do the event. Um, but anyway, the long and the short is yes, we, we do some online training for our volunteers. Um, to your point, you know, we have got volunteers from Google and these people, these are developers. They're not people who hang access points and configure firewalls all day long. So they are tech people, very smart tech people um, with a really valuable skill set but they don't necessarily have it when it comes down to you know the physical layer so we do try to to, to teach our volunteers new skills um even though again they may be a you know a 15 year tenured person but they may be a developer a mobile developer they may write app like applications and vice versa we have people that work for the telephone company that don't necessarily have any experience when it comes down to desktop su support or or you know those types of things. Um, we probably don't do as much community training as I would like to. I think it's very important. And the one takeaway um, that I'd like for you know everybody on the call to do, which is, I mean, if you work for a city, a county, a state, whoever that is, get involved in their emergency planning. Um, you know, Don, we talked about second nets and the value of the libraries in disaster. There's a huge value there. And I think, you know, a, a lot of the emergency managers may not think about that as a resource to them. Uh, they may think about them for their building or they may think about them for, you know, other things. But I don't know that they think about them as, you know, kind of that community hub, certainly with the connectivity that they have. And, and you know, if they're lucky enough that it's that connectivity is is still there and unimpeded, you know, or unaffected by a disaster. I mean, that is a valuable resource. So I would encourage everybody to do tabletop exercises. Some some of them do them once a year, some of them do them quarterly. Uh, but I would definitely, you know, reach out to the emergency management team uh, that you work under that works with your organization and and let them know. Make sure that you're part of their plan. Well, great. Maybe we can maybe we can put a workshop together just for that very uh, activity uh, online and 
uh, see who uh, who wants to uh, uh, participate. Uh, it, uh, we had a an outage here where where I am in the Bay Area several years ago uh, that was caused by the fires up north in Sonoma, uh, north of here. So it wiped out. It put heavily, heavily impacted the uh, the the grid. So the utility cut the power in the county where I live. Quarter million people, just without warning, just turned it off. And there was no physical damage here. We had a little smoke drifting in, but you know nothing was was physically harmed. But we were out of power for five to seven days, and it gets your attention. Uh, you know, I, I've never, I've never been in an actual disaster, uh, but this was a kind of a practice run. And so, you know, the first thing you think about after the first few hours, it, it may not come back on, uh, Wi-Fi is out. So, and the cell system is completely overloaded because it's the only thing that's up. So it's practically useless because it's just jammed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what, and then after 24 hours, you're thinking about what's in the freezer <laughs> and who you're going to invite over for dinner <laughs> and, and how are you going to find out what's going on? Because you just, your, your battery has died. So what happened, and this is to the point of preparations, is that every one, every community had some hub, whether it was the library here in this town or the community center in the town just north that had a uh, backup power. And a, and a live uh, link, and they, the these buildings were filled with people, daisy chained on power strips, charging their devices, and utilizing that that uh, capacity to to communicate. And it was really something to to see so many people crammed into a space, trying to communicate and recharge so they could you know have this basic flow of information. But the uh, the local library didn't have enough capacity, uh, broadband capacity to support uh, 150 people at the same time. So they needed to think about that, how to harden their communication and how to have, I think, to your point, redundant communication built in. This is this would be our our lesson and learning from the second net you mentioned. This is an idea that that anchor institutions can collaborate to create a a wide area secondary network because they are second responders in the term that we've used after emergency responders, which in a disaster, they're completely overwhelmed. Uh, and so having these, these uh, hubs for communication where their, their communication, their distribution sites, all the things you've said, having them live uh, is really, really valuable. Uh, so the cell system can be up, but it's not necessarily uh, able to support the demand in in a large event. So uh, this has just been a fantastic uh, session, Joe. I hope everybody has been taking notes, uh, and um, we will we will Joe. Let's follow up. Let's talk about the the value of how we might construct a workshop for for preparations if if you're if you're interested in it at all. And sure. otherwise, we'd like to give you the the last word here and close out the the session. Well, I I just you know, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, my my guidance to you, and I appreciate everybody who's taken the time to join. I actually see some familiar names on here, so um, that that's fantastic uh, to see them involved in uh, in your sessions. Uh, I would say that, and that's one of them right there, Dan. Welcome. Um, so I also happened to see one of the other guys on here that was part of uh, the recovery team that went to Curry County. So um, fantastic to see uh, those the people in attendance. So all that to say, I mean, if, if you know, my contact information, I believe was in the, I'm not sure if it was actually or not. Uh, and I don't know that I have it on a slide here, but I will say, you know, I make myself available. Feel free to reach out to us uh, if there's anything that we can do to help you in your planning. Certainly, if your community experiences an event, you know, feel free to reach out to us for that. But, you know, in the meantime, think about, you know, what we talked about today. People are going to need connectivity. People are going to need charge to charge their devices. Um, obviously, supporting your community, um, you know, after a disaster is an important thing. And 
realizing that you may also be impacted or your staff may also be impacted. So be prepared to do a lot with less. Um, so I would make those packs with, you know, nearby libraries and you know, perhaps they can come over, send some staff over to help you staff your own library uh, when this happens. But just, you know, depending on the event, I mean, it, it, it certainly could uh, impact you personally. So, uh, Don, I don't have a ton more to share. I know we're at time, but I, I appreciate the opportunity and I really appreciate Phil, Phil for coming coming on on short notice and um, you know, sharing your story. I think it's super important and hopefully the folks will get, you know, have some sort of takeaway from that. Thank you very much, Joe. And, and thank you, Phil, for this uh, uh, last minute response. It's in the spirit of ITDRC, uh, rapid response. Uh, and we, we very much appreciate it. It's, um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, the, the, the point Phil was making about uh, uh uh, the how 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 nice all these people are and when they come in uh is it, true we were we were helping uh, trying to help the library in paradise california where the fire wiped out the entire community uh in in their recovery process which is in, amazingly cumbersome i mean there's all the damage and then there's all the bureaucracy on top of that which is just always there we're talking about public institutions and all kinds of you know, liability fears that get in the way of actually doing things sometimes. But the guys were just, all the people up there were just amazing. Uh, and I can see how these friendships form. Uh, this is just the way people are. And you, you, you're recruiting some really nice people. This is what's so wonderful. Another thing wonderful about ITDRC. And ITDRC.org is how you can find them. That was in the, that's on the, all the information and and you can find Joe through that as well. So with that, I think we will call this a day and a really valuable session that uh, uh, will be of help to people today and tomorrow. And we urge you all, if you're not technical people, to let your technical people know about this resource. And you can point them to this recording if you want to, when we get it up, hopefully by tomorrow. So with that, we will close the recording right now.